we glory highly sing in glory hallelujah sing in glory glory hallelujah his truth is marching Sing in glory, glory, hallelujah. Oh, glory, glory, hallelujah. Sing in glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching. Sing in glory, glory, hallelujah. Oh, glory, glory, hallelujah. Sing in glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is. Good morning. Good morning. All right, that's a lot better. My name is Brandon Blue, and I am the president of SGA and I will be your master of ceremony today. You may be seated. All right. We will first have a welcome by our president, Dr. Neil Weaver, and then following after him, we will have a poem by Miss Asia Brinson. Thank you, Brandon. And uh, on behalf of the faculty, the staff, the students, of Georgia Southwestern. It's my pleasure to welcome you to campus and uh, to thank you for joining us today for this celebration. This has uh, been happening here on this university for over 40 years and we're excited to continue uh, this tradition and, and this great opportunity to recognize uh, Dr. King and, and remember what he brought to us and the message that he continues to deliver, his legacy that he continues to deliver to us that we try to live up to every day. I want to uh, especially thank Ms. Kena Davis for her work in organizing uh, this event today. And you can see on the back of your program all of the organizations that have had a part in this, and I want to thank them and the entire committee that works with Kena. This is a special day at Georgia Southwestern, and we appreciate you being here to help us celebrate. So let's have a, a great celebration and a wonderful day. Good morning. I will be reading to you the ballad of Martin Luther King. Born with the legacy he had to fulfill, his life was constantly marching uphill. Until he could reach the mountaintop, he realized this was something he could never stop. His visions for mankind came from his heart. His visions of brotherhood, which he saw torn apart, gave him the drive, the desire, the goal to teach us the lesson. We're all from one soul. As always, when someone who has great desire can stir with his words a flame and a fire, along comes the hose to water it down and try to make the words go, make them all drown. But words won't be drowned, they'll always be heard. The words of this leader will keep the heart stirred, making an imprint that won't go away until all of us realize and finally say, free at last, we are free at last.
Thank you, Dr. Weaver and Miss Asia Brinson. Now we will have a solo by Miss Laurel Carey and an invocation by Reverend Norris Harris. Let us pray. Our Father and our strong God, we come boldly before your throne, bowing our heads toward Mother Earth from which we came. For today we lift our eyes toward the hills from whence cometh our help. 
Our help coming from you and you alone. So today we come before you with adoration, giving you all the glory and praise due to you. We also come before you with confession, admitting that we are sinners saved by your grace. And we bring all our supplication before you this day. Then, O oh, Heavenly Father, we're not selfish in our prayers. We intercede on behalf of others. So we come before you with intercession. Interceding on behalf of this university, the students, the faculty here, all that it goes to make up this place of uh, education. Then, O oh, Heavenly Father, we look all around us and we see that you have blessed us. We come before you with gratification. Thanking you for all you have done and what you will do and allowing us this day to live in the future of a dream, to live in the future of something that was prophesied some years ago, that I have a dream. And today, O oh, and Father, that dream is still being fulfilled. We ask you to anchor us, O oh, and Father, in the faith that we can continue growing your grace and continue to do the things that you would have us to do to make our world a better place, place to live. Then, O Heavenly Father, when we think about how good you have been, we know that it was your grace and mercy that you extended to the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, and that same grace being extended to us. And we pray this day that someone in the audience today may be inspired by the speaker who's going to speak, may be inspired by the program being here today, and continue in the future to carry on this legacy. It's in the mighty name of Jesus Christ we do pray. Amen. And let the church say amen. amen. Hallelujah. All right. Now we're going to have an occasion by Mr. Jeremy Copeland. And after that, we will have the wreath bearers. Good morning, everyone. And to our guest today, I say welcome. My name is Jeremy Copeland, and I have been given the honor and the responsibility of reminding us why we are here today. We are here to honor the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., civil rights activist, leader, and minister who from the years of 1955 to 1968 embodied the essence of servant leadership, who crafted for us the outline for activism that causes change but not harm, whose vision of equality and justice was so detailed and tangible that we took it as truth, so much so that we take the third Monday in every January just to remember what he said and did. Westminster Abbey thought it necessary to include his likeness in the Hall of Modern Martyrs. Washington, D.C. houses his memorial. The results of his actions were glamorous but the work was ugly. And we often forget about the work, but the work hasn't stopped. Each year we celebrate Dr. King's life and legacy. We respectfully memorialize his time here on earth, but I often think that we forget that we have been called into action. Refusing polariza polarization, I think we should step towards the future in boldness, standing on the principles of love and faith, allowing these principles to drive our actions, honoring Dr. King not just in ceremony, but in deed. In closing, I have come to some conclusions that I put in the form of questions. How does love become a practice? How can it be expressed here now with each other 
on this campus? What motivates us to change? I think the reality that Dr. King has presented to us is that there is a divide between what ought to be and what is. As we take this moment to be reflective, I believe it should remind us to keep pursuing the ideal situation we would like to see. Through remembering his words today, I hope that vision meets action and causes change. Thank you. Will everyone please stand? At this time, we will have our reed bearers to come forward, and we will have Mr. Jordan Ford of AAMI to come and do our read observance. This wreath symbolizes a fallen leader, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who was a leader for justice, peace, and righteousness. As we view this wreath today, let us be reminded of Dr. King's eloquent pleas for equality and justice for all of God's children, regardless of race, creed, or color. And let us, by his example, try to love and serve humanity in a more Christian way. You all may be seated. And next, we will have a selection by the GSW Concert Choir. Following that selection, we will have the introduction of the speaker by Dr. Laura Bourne.
I have the honor of introducing a longtime friend and colleague as our guest speaker. You will see in the program bio that Dr. Myron Pope has a distinguished career in service, specifically in higher education and government. I want to take a moment and tell you about him as a person. Dr. Pope and I were introduced to each other as colleagues in Oklahoma several years ago. And over the years, we've shared friends, colleagues, mentors, we've worked on projects together, and we've kept in touch. Dr. Pope is, a passion, is passionate about serving students and helping them find their success. He is one of the most giving individuals that I know. He gives us of his time unselfishly and goes above and beyond to make sure someone has what they need. He is also one of those individuals who makes you feel like you're the most important person in a room. He is truly authentic. He's a type of friend and colleague who checks on you without a reason. He's one of those leaders that inspires others to do and be the best that they can be. He is kind and caring and compassionate. He's also fun and just a little bit competitive. Of course, I guess you have to be if you played for the University of Alabama. Please help me welcome Dr. Pope. He will join the, um, the podium after our GSW Gospel Choir does a song for us. So. And now, taking to the stand, we have the GSW Gospel Choir, and we will have our speaker following Dr. Myron Pope.
Good morning, everyone. Say good morning, everyone. Good morning. Let's give them another round of applause. Weren't they amazing? Again, good morning to the family of the Georgia Southwestern University community, and I'm so delighted to have this opportunity to be here. To Dr. Weaver, First Lady Christy Weaver, Dr. Bourne, my friends from many years ago during our professional stints in the, state, the fine state of Oklahoma, and greetings also to a remainder of the administrative team, the faculty, staff, and certainly this fine community as a whole. I am very humbled and honored to be here today with you as part of this wonderful program, and thus far it has been amazing, so thank you for allowing me to be a part of this celebration. I've, I have read from afar the history of this institution, this community, and certainly the background of former President Jimmy Carter, and I'm so happy to finally be able to experience it firsthand. Additionally, I was elated to be able to see firsthand the work of my former colleagues, Dr. Weaver and Dr. Bourne. We worked together for many years in the state of Oklahoma, and it was it's great to be here and see the work that they're conducting here to create a passionate environment focused on student learning. We share this great passion that we know is so critical to our society. The passion for creating the next generation of leaders is one that has become my life's journey. So it is always a blessing to see colleagues and talk to them about the work that they do. We're always focused on helping our students to become ethical, engaged, creative, and diversity-minded citizens. So thank you, Dr. Weaver and Dr. Boren, for extending the invitation for me to speak to here today, and thank you for their fine leadership. Let's give them a round of applause. Let me get to the topic at hand. I've been tasked with the complex expectation of relaying an inspiring and comforting message about the life of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., to fit with your theme of building a bold dream and reality, who you see versus who I am. I have done these types of speeches before, and I have heard so many of these speeches myself. And hearing so many of these, I always realize that they all fall short in comparison with the great speeches that Dr. King himself delivered about so many topics. Therefore, I want to warn you that I am not Dr. King. I am a mere mortal who is trying to convey my perception of how this man and his work in the context of where your university and our society are today. From a very young age, I heard about Dr. King. I grew up in a small town in the Black Belt of Southwest Alabama called Sweetwater. I grew up in a household with my mother, my great-grandmother, and my grandmother, all of whom had been sharecroppers who had been poor and destitute most of their lives. My mother was a first-generation student. She went off to college and graduated, but returned to the region because, uh, to become a teacher. My grandparents, in fear, of many, in, in fear of many ways for her safety during such turbulent times during the 60s, insisted on her returning to the community, in spite of her desire to go on to med school at Meharry University. They felt like it was, it was just too far away and so unsafe for a young black woman so she reserved herself to becoming an educator for the next 48 years, with most of it being a school counselor, which she enjoyed. Her ultimate goal was to create pathways for young people from some of the most impoverished and undereducated communities in that part of Alabama to attend post-secondary education. Therefore, you know that it was not a question of if I was going to college, it was just a matter of where. I went on more, more campus visits than any college, any kid in the history of this country. <laughs> she was constantly taking students across the country, and I had a chance to be a, a part of that. Because of her efforts to allow her students to see these many opportunities, I grew and learned a lot about higher education. I find no irony in the reality that I now work on a college campus. Also, I experienced many visits to so many of the historical places that people today describe as the places where the civil rights movement started or concluded. You see, she attempted to open the world to her students in so many ways so that they saw beyond the limited opportunities presented to them in that community. I was a recipient of that experience also. As we were within an hour or two drive of Selma and Montgomery, and maybe three hours from Montgomery, I learned much about the turbulent histories and, cer and certainly about the work of Dr. King and everything that he was doing in those communities. 
During the summers, my mom uh, attended school for many summers at Alabama State University in Montgomery. And she drove about 100 miles daily with her friends, and in many of those days, I was very much in tow. We would drive across the Edmund Pettus Bridge on those journeys, the same bridge that Dr. King led a historic march for voting rights in 1965, along with the immortal John Lewis, who represented this great state for many years. The event was recognized as Bloody Sunday because of the brutal attack on the protesters who were part of this demonstration by the Alabama Highway Patrolmen. We rode the 50 miles of highway from Selma to Montgomery each day, the same journey that protesters marched in, symbolic act, in this symbolic act of insurrection to demonstrate for justice and voting rights and equal, equality overall. I heard the history lessons in school about these events, but it was even more so rewarding to see these firsthand. I also remember my first time at the historic site where Dr. King is entombed in Atlanta. It was a cold, dreary day on that first visit, but I wanted to sit there forever because I felt like I would receive something from just being there. I did receive something. That experience, those experiences, shaped me as the person that I am today. Dr. King had a very unique gift of leadership. He was able to do that through his words in many ways. He had so many speeches and they covered so many topics. Through all of them, he had the ability to educate while also to incriminate. Comfort while making the listener feel comfortable, uncomfortable. Inspire while also chastise. Make you think while also inspire you to take action. That was the power of his speeches. There's much to be said about knowing your audience and speaking to them, and he was able to proverbially kill several uh, birds with one stone due, due to his ability to influence so many audiences with each of his speeches. One speech stood out to me from Dr. King's many eloquent orations as I was considering your theme today. Again, building a bold theme in reality, who you see versus who I am. On October 26, 1967, six months before he was assassinated, Dr. Martin Luther King visited Philadelphia for a star-studded event at the Spectrum Arena. And for some of, those, uh, some of you who are a little bit older, like me, you'll remember the Spectrum uh, Center being the place where the Philadelphia 76ers used to play basketball back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. That facility is now long gone, so I digress as I'm showing my age here. Anyway, the main event was a celebrity-studded fundraiser featuring Harry Belafonte. Sidney Poitier, Aretha Franklin, Nipsey Russell, and many other big African-American celebrity names of the time. But earlier in the day, Dr. King squeezed a brief appearance in at Philadelphia's Barrett Junior High School to talk to the students there. Unlike many of his major addresses, Dr. King used this occasion to speak directly to the teenagers, imploring them to recognize their self-worth and the choices they faced at the dawn of their lives. It was not unusual for him to do this, but it was still very rare for him to do so on such a small scale, with speeches like this to such a limited number of students. The speech started with one simple and certainly soul-searching question, and that question was, I want to ask you a question, he said, and that is, what is in your life's blueprint? Let me read a little bit more of you what that speech contained to provide you with some more context. He continued, this is the most important and crucial period of your lives. For what you do now and what you decide now at this age may well determine which way your life will go. And when, whenever a building is constructed, you usually have an architect who draws a blueprint. And that blueprint serves as the pattern, as the guide, as the model, for those who are to build the building. And a building is not yet, not well erected without a, without a good, sound, and solid blueprint. Now each of you is in the process of building the structure of your lives. And the question is whether you have a proper, a solid, and a sound blueprint. And I want to suggest some of the things that you should be doing in your life's development of your blueprint, end of quote. Today I want you to dig deep and start thinking about your blueprint. It is my hope that what is said today, to you today contributes to you creating that blueprint. It is my hope that it serves as a foundation for your future, 
More than anything, it is my hope that it contributes to building a bold dream that is focused on you and not on what I or others feel you should be. Now please note that the message today is not just for young people. I'm constantly thinking about my blueprint, my plan, my journey each day. No matter what our age, we should constantly be considering what role and what purpose we serve in our daily lives. I had a good mentor, uh, Dr. Don Betts, who Dr. Weaver and Dr. Boren both know, who used to always remind us when he spoke that he would, we should always strive to leave the woodpile higher than we found it. It is a symbolic statement of the reality that we should always focus on making the world around us a little bit better than the way we found it. We're but a grain of sand in the history of mankind, but but what is our plan for making the world a better place during this brief, brief period of time? Dr. King employed the students on that day to do three things, and I won't, I'm, I'm going to share those with you. It is my hope by sharing those with you with a morsel of my personal experiences and a little bit of wisdom that it will contribute to your blueprint, a solidification of you, your, you being who you are on this journey to your bold dream. The first thing that he encourages them to do is to to have a deep belief in your own, uh, own dignity, your own worth, and your somebodiness. You probably heard the, the inspiring chant where the group leader will yell out, I am, and the crowd yells back, somebody. Have you ever heard that one? Again, I am, somebody. I am. Dr. King preached this quite often. It is a very deep message of hope and, and self-encouragement. My grandmother used to say something along these lines, don't allow anybody to make you feel less than what God has created you to be. I challenge you to embrace that today and every day. If you don't believe in yourself, no one else will. I'm a, test a testament to that in so many ways. One of my greatest experiences as a college student was to be part of two SEC championships and a national championship team. I started that journey as a walk-on. I was from a 1A high school, the smallest division in the state, and I didn't have any offers to play college football. However, I felt that I could do it. And if I had, had not had that mindset, if I had embraced the naysayers' perceptions that I would not make it, I would not have done it. Why do I bring that up? What does athletics have to do with life? Well, that accomplished demonstrated to me that anything is possible. Last week, I had a chance to be in Indianapolis I had a little bit of a football game going on there as a uh, employee of the University of Alabama, and ironically, I'm here in the state of Georgia. It's the team here that probably beat our team, but you know, you know how that goes. As an administrator, and um, also, dare I say, a little bit older and more mature man now, I realize now more the magnitude of that accomplishment. As I watched a young man from Georgia rush onto the field and that, that experience, and, the, and just to think about the hard work that they put into it day in and day out, it was a huge accomplishment. And just to think that we start with hundreds of teams at the start of the year, and to end up at that point is the pinnacle of success. I appreciate it even, even more to my experience in 1992 being, being able to experience that. It was one of the many things that I have achieved in life, but in all those things, I continue to wake up with the mindset that I am somebody. And I realized that from that day to this one, that I must first believe that myself. I challenge you to do the same each day in spite of what anyone else tells you. Your life has great significance, and I want you to always believe in your heart that you are beautiful and worthy, regardless of what the world defines as beautiful and worthy. You define you and your somebodiness. You determine your blueprint. I am. Thank you. Secondly, Dr. King states, in your life's blueprint, you must have the basic principle, uh, basic principle, which is the determination to achieve excellence in your various fields of endeavor. This is such a critical one, and is the essence of what I talk about each day in terms of leadership. Everyone believes that if you are successful, you have to be the CEO, the president, the lead senior, the drum ma major. Nothing is further from the truth. As institutions of higher education, everyone expects us to create uh, leaders. I always ask if students really know what that means. What does it mean to be a leader? And consequently, do we really know as professionals? I ask myself that every day. 
What is our role in creating that next generation of leaders? To me, it is challenging, it is helping students to realize that they must be their best self regardless of where they are in the organization. At my previous institution, you used to talk about the golden loop, which was the path around campus that we would take prospective students on as they did tours. We wanted the campus to be pristine along this path, and certainly we wanted the best storytellers along that pathway. That was not the president's job, but the jobs of everyone on that campus, from the person in that position as the president, all the way down to the groundskeepers. No matter how much the president said it was a beautiful and safe place, no matter how much the faculty said that the institution had the most relevant uh, academic material being taught in the classroom, no matter how much the recruiter talked about it being the right fit for the student, if a student and their parents didn't feel it, and if they didn't um, see it, that it didn't matter. And it only took one breakdown along that golden loop from someone who in many people's minds may have been insignificant to totally create that, change that perspective. We noted that it started with creating that field as soon as the student arrived on campus. It was making sure that the facilities were clean and well maintained, the classes were taught by the best, and, uh, best trained and educated professionals, and so on throughout. Those little things make a difference. And it took the people who were not at the highest levels of the organizational chart, but throughout the organization, taking pride in their work. It took them realizing their role in the process. They had to be the best groundskeepers, janitorial staff members, faculty, student life professionals, recruiters, to ensure that the organization achieved its mission of recruiting, educating, and graduating students. I had a coach who used to always say the key to success is surrounding yourself with, uh, with good people. I believe that, but you must also make sure that they understand their role in the organization when you make them a part of it. That also means that you should also understand your role in the organization. One of the statements that Dr. Keene made during his speech was, as, uh, this, at, the, at the junior high school that day was, if it falls to your lot to be a street sweeper, Sweep streets like Michelangelo painted pictures. Sweep streets like Beethoven composed music. Sweep streets like Leontine Price sings before the Metropolitan Opera. And sweep streets like Shakespeare wrote poetry. Sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will have to pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper who swept his job well. That is something that I, I want to encourage you to do. Ask yourself, Am I the best version of myself that I can be? Who is doing this work and excelling at it, and how do I learn from the best? Am I where my feet are, which literally means not thinking about the future, but being in the moment and excelling in the moment? Be a leader in all that you do by being the best that you can be. Instill that level of excellence into your blueprint today. Finally, the third thing that Dr. King stated to the students during this speech was that they should have a commitment to the eternal principles of beauty, love, and justice. No matter your age, you have the responsibility to seek to make life better for everybody. You must be involved in the struggle for freedom and justice. Dr. King stated in one of my favorite quotes of his, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. I'm reading a book right now that a mentor shared called The Second Mountain, and it's subtitled The Quest for a Moral Life. It uses the analogy of mountains to illustrate its point that we miss the most important things in life sometimes because our goals are selfish and misguided. Many of you have done this, as I have, and some of you will experience it later in life. But we go off to school, we start a career, and we begin climbing that first mountain. Once we arrive at the top and we, we, we feel like we are, you know, are finally arrived and we're, we're there, we realize that we're not satisfied. The peak is not exactly what we expected. We're disappointed. We're frustrated because our lives are not what we dreamed it would be. Our goals, when this happens, were probably built on materialism and selfish, selfishness more than anything. When that happens, we begin to think about the second mountain so we began a new journey, so to speak. That mountain is one that is not self-centered, but other-centered. Individuals who have arrived at this point in their lives focus on the things that are truly worth wanting and not the things that other people tell them to want. Let me repeat that. They focus on the things that are worthy to them and not the things that other people tell them to want. 
They embrace a life of inter interdependence and not independence. The focus is on how to help others. That is what life is, uh, is all about, the second mountain. I hope that you will discover that earlier than many discover it, but in creating this blueprint that Dr. King speaks of, try not to make it about what others want you to be. Make it about what matters to you and make it about meaningful things. You define what that meaning is in your blueprint. As you develop it, it is important that you ask, the, ask these, follow, these following questions. Am I realizing that this is bigger than me? And am I realizing that this is not just about me? Be your best and understand that it is not about you. Even though our great theme today focuses on you and your blueprint, your bold dream, realize that you gain the most from life when you focus on the big picture. My, coach, my head coach in college, my last three years of college, was Gene Stallings, and he used to occasionally mention this poem, and it was always interesting to see this, uh, um, you know, West Texas, uh, East Texas guy stand up and read poetry, but he used to always read this one particular poem by Linda Ellis called The Dash, and some of you probably have heard it. The Dash goes like this. I read of a man who stood to speak at a funeral of a friend who referred to the dates on the tombstone from the beginning to the end. He noted that first came the date of birth and spoke of the following date with tears, but said what mattered most of all was the dash between those years. For that dash represents all the time they spent alive on earth, and not only those who loved them, but what, they, what, little, what that little line is worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash. What matters is how we lived and loved and how we spend our dash. So think about this long and hard. Are there things you'd like to change? For you never know how much time is left that, will still, that still can be rearranged. Be less quick to anger and show appreciation more and love, that, love the people in, your, in our lives like we've never loved before. If we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, remembering that this special dash might only last for a while. So when your eulogy is being read, with your life's actions to rehash, would you be proud of the things that, that they say about you and how you lived your dash? It's a point that has stuck with me for the last 25 years and I call, so often go back to it and it makes me remember exactly what it is that I should be, how I should be living on this earth. The speech Dr. King, uh, by Dr. King at that high school in Philadelphia right before his death symbolized where he was at that point in his life. Even though it's one of his shorter speeches, it was one that has been the most impactful for so many. I read an article of the 50th anniversary of the speech and the writer interviewed the students who were, who were there that day. They talked about how that speech was instrumental in their lives in so many ways. It was instrumental in them creating their blueprint for wonderful and fulfilling lives. I hope that you will take this notion of a life's blueprint as you boldly dream and define your experience based upon you and what you desire for life, while remembering the importance of always leaving the woodpile a little bit higher than you found it. Best wishes to you, and God bless. Thank you, Dr. Myron Pope, for that wonderful speaking. Next, we will have a presentation and remarks by Ms. Keenan Davis. At this time, our first presentation will come from Mr. Jeremy Copeland, Jeremy Copeland president of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Mr. Pope, Dr. Pope, thank you for your presentation today. Um, on behalf of the Mu Delta chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, we'd like to present you with this token of our appreciation today. Just thank you for coming out and providing us with that beautiful speech. Thank you.
Dr. Pope, will you please come back up to the podium? On the behalf of the 20, 2022 MLK Committee, we would like to present you this token of appreciation for being our speaker today at the um, 42nd Annual MLK Convocation. One more time, Dr. Pope. <laughs> Will the members of the GSW MPHC please stand? Mr. Pope, with you being a member of the best fraternity that I know, Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity, upholding the principles of brotherhood, scholarship, and service, the members of the National Panhandling Council here at Georgia Southwestern State University would like to present you with a small token of appreciation. Thank you. you may be seated. Today we have two pastors in, from our community that have participated in our ML Convocation program for several years. When we call Bishop Melvin McCluster, he always answers and come and lead us in our hymns for our breakfast and for our convocation. And when we call Reverend Norris Harris, he always answers as well, being on our program either during the invocation or the benediction. For their many years of service to GSW by means of the MLK convocation, we would like to present them with a small token of appreciation. Will Bishop McCluster and Reverend Harris please come forward at this time? On behalf of the MLK committee, please accept this small appreciation for your participation in all our MLK convocations. Thank you. Thank you. On the behalf of Georgia Southwestern State University administrators, faculty, staff, and students, and the MLK Convocation Committee, I would like to thank everyone that helped make this event possible. First, I would like to thank Dr. Weber and Dr. Boren for entrusting us with this assignment of being the MLK Convocation Committee. At this time, when I call your name, please stand and be recognized. The 22, 2022 MLK Convocation Committee. Ms. Al Makeda, Ms. Angie Christmas, Ms. Tammy Milliton, Mr. Chris Avery serve as our staff. And for our students, we have Ms. Asia Brinson, Ms. Laurel Carey, Mr. Brandon Blue, Mr. Jordan Ford, and Mr. Jeremy Copeland. Thank you for being a part of the 2022 MLK Convocation Committee. You may be seated. Next, I would like to thank the following people and organizations. Dr. Myron Pope, Sumter County High School JROTC, GSW Concert Choir and Southwest Civic Chorus, GSW Brotherhood, GSW Gospel Choir, the National Panhandling Council, Student African American Brotherhood, Student Government Association, Strong United Assertive Educated Women, Suave, the African Male Institute, the GSW Athletic Department, Aladdin Food Services, Physical Plant, GSW Division of Business and Finance, the Office of the President, and the GSW Division of Student Engagement and Success. A big thank you go out to all the students, faculty, and staff who participated in this week's MLK series. On tonight, we will have our panel discussion at 6 p.m. in room 127 in the administration building. So if you are able, please attend. At this time, I will turn the floor back over to Mr. Brandon Blue, president of SGA.
All righty. Next, we're going to have the singing of the Negro National Anthem by the GSW Gospel Choir, following by the benediction. And also, um, if you all students who have not signed in to receive W2W credit, please sign in with Dr. Grissett. Thank you. If you would bow with me. Jesus, we thank you that you taught us how to pray. And so we do pray to our Father, who is the Father of all mankind. 
Lord, thank you that you created all of us. And just like we heard today, we are somebody and we have worth and value just because you created us and we are your children. So we do pray to you, our Father. We also ask that you would be honored for you are worthy and deserving, that your name be praised as holy. God, we ask that your kingdom would come and your will be done, your good and perfect will with love for all, with justice and equity for all people. We pray these things would come and we surrender and submit ourselves so that the things that you long to see, you would use us to bring about in these days. God, we ask that you do provide for us our daily bread, the things that we need for our community, for our students. We pray that you give us the financial resources that we need. We pray for careers and job opportunities. We pray for the continued ability to learn and grow and go to school. And God, we pray that you would give us things like hope as well. That you would give us things like faith and encouragement and determination and grit. God, we ask that you forgive us our debts. God, would you forgive us for prejudice and racism? God, would you forgive us for bigotry? Would you, like Laurel sang before, cleanse and give us new hearts? And God, would you help us to forgive those who have trespassed against us? God, we pray you would lead us not into temptation, but you would deliver us. God, guide us into things that will build us up and help us spur one another on. Help us come together in unity and keep us from things that would divide us. Keep us from bitterness. Keep us, God, from hatred or judgment. In all these things, God, we look to you and we wait upon you, believing that you will do these things as we submit ourselves to you. So God, do a great work here at Georgia Southwestern. Do a great work in America in Sumter County, in the state of Georgia, in this nation and among all peoples who you love. God, we thank you, we give you our praise, and we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you all for coming. May God bless you and remember the legacy and the life of MLK. God bless. You are dismissed.